I know on the second channel I'm supposed to do an individual review of all of the parts. I only did like part one a few weeks back and part two isn't one of my favorites so I wasn't really looking forward to covering part two uh, and I was just trying to get my footing back on the main channel and all of that but I will be doing the other individual reviews on the second channel so I'll leave the link to that in the description below go subscribe to that if you haven't already but by the title of this video it should be pretty obvious uh, I'm going to be talking as to why I think part seven is very different from the other parts in JoJo's and why it's a masterpiece so to start off Part 7 essentially takes the best aspects of JoJo's and just does it better. For instance, one of my criticisms on JoJo's is at times it's formulaic villain of the week that at times can feel extremely repetitive, but in Part 7, it really does take that and adds a more natural flow to it than there is in other parts at times. I think that is large due in fact to the race and that there's currently this pacing that needs to be continued because of this race. Therefore, it's not really like, oh, they're walking or they're just chilling in some place and then bam, a villain pops up for no reason or they run into this villain just because. At times, that's what it feels like in the other parts, despite in the overall context it makes sense. In part 7, I definitely think it flows and reads a lot more smoothly chapter to chapter. I think also one of the benefits part 7 has compared to its predecessor part 6 is that it's kind of a reboot, if you will. Therefore, the author can kind of do what he wants with this part without having to really use characters that connect to previous parts, if that makes sense. I feel like part 6 was a little tied down due to the fact that the author was kind of not necessarily running out of ideas, but if not trying to switch things up from how he was doing it in the first five parts, but this time with part seven, it's set in a completely new world, new setting, new characters that do mirror the characters that we previously do love from the early parts, such as Dio now being Diego, Jonathan essentially now being Johnny, and then you have Jairo Zapelli, who in fact is the best Joe bro. I'm sorry, I know Okuyasu's cool and funny and whatnot, but I mean, come on. Another aspect that I just thought about when reading part seven and looking back on it is I really do appreciate how the characters seem to go a lot deeper. And I think part of that would have to be that these characters seem to have a lot more of a relatable and realistic motivation or purpose as to why they do what they do instead of just some wacky ridiculousness that at times seems to be the case with previous parts with the exception i'd say of like yoshi got kikita in part four because he just wants to be a normal guy part seven also boasts having the best minor antagonist in ringo road again he was done extremely well backstory showdown his ability it was all just encompassed nicely the side characters in part seven also do their job appropriately they don't do too much they don't do too little they don't seem to be annoying or just unnecessary slowing down the pacing of the story. And all of this is just encompassed by the race, and so I wanna get this out of the way. Uh, more of this minor stuff that I've been pointing out before I get into Funny and Gyro and Johnny is the overall dynamic of the race ties this all perfectly and well. Again, it really does help the pacing of the story, constantly feeling like there's this intensity, this goal that needs to be reached and achieved. Therefore, these characters meet, again, in a much more natural way than I think they do in the previous parts. The story itself, I think, is really well fleshed out and written, and just the overall concept of having this race where the actual motive is to collect the parts of Jesus' corpse is just insane. Honestly, like, what was Araki on when you wrote this part? And where and can where I get can it? Because he, he did a great job. job. Now, there were a few things in part seven that threw me off and that were a little odd. For instance, the whole thing with Lucy. Like, I understand Mr. Steel was actually a really, really good guy and kind hearted and whatnot. But Lucy's still like 14. And then you had the whole shenanigans with the first lady. And it was cool when Lucy pretended to be the first lady. But again, first lady, that's a female. She's like 14. What are you doing? Like, part 7 does definitely still have that wacky, weird stuff that JoJo's has in its previous parts. But those aren't necessarily criticisms, those are just, like, moments that you could just point at and make fun of. Also, I will give him extreme props for having Diego, this version of Dio, and making him extremely relevant and important to the story without him necessarily outshining the main antagonist, which I don't really think is possible because Funny Valentine is the best villain in JoJo. I know, Kira's my favorite too, but we gotta give it a funny. But I'll cover him a little later on in the story. Now I really want to get into the dynamic between Gyro and Johnny, and why I think their dynamic works to a point much better than a lot of the other 1-2 combo punches in the previous JoJo parts. Now, not every single part in JoJo's has this, but for the majority, you could say that in JoJo's, at times the Jobro 
or the side character, not minor character, but side character, correction, because in one of my videos, or my video talking about JoJo's, I said minor character, and then I mentioned Koichi. Koichi isn't a minor character, I messed up, sorry, but getting to the point. One of my issues at times is some of the JoJo's, or if not the majority of the JoJo protagonists, get outdone or outshined by their Jobro or side character. You could definitely argue Bruno is better than Giorno, although Giorno does put in plenty of work. I think Jolene outdoes all of her side characters. Josuke, in my opinion, gets outdone by Koichi. Jotaro, you could say, gets outdone by Polnareff. And although it's really cool seeing the friendship, I feel like the dynamic between the protagonist and their side character could be a lot better done to the point where the side character actually serves the protagonist in making him a better character, similar to what we saw with Zapelli and Jonathan in part 1. And I think the main reason as to why Gyro and Johnny work so well for me is because Gyro serves not only the role of Joe Bro and side character, but if not mentor to Johnny. Therefore, the moments where he takes the lead or outshines Johnny feels natural and makes sense due to what Johnny currently is within the story and how he's still growing throughout his part. We see how Gyro has his backstory and tied into what duty is and fate and all of that and how he really does stand out at the beginning without us knowing anything about him but of course the attention is drawn to him and early on throughout the story when he really does outshine or outwork Johnny it seems to make sense it also I want to include that Johnny puts in a considerable amount of work but it all really does make sense and it's understandable due to the fact that well um Johnny is basically crippled therefore in those moments of Gyro really outshining Johnny at times as a character and in the fights again is due to the fact that Johnny is crippled and that Gyro is serving as this mentor to Johnny essentially that you're going to take the mantle when I'm done with it. And the real beauty of it is it's not only Johnny who grows and continues to develop uh, more than from what we saw in his original backstory, but Gyro also learns from being with Johnny. And so now getting into Johnny, I definitely can say with a good amount of confidence that Johnny is the best written character of all of the JoJo protagonists. And that should basically tell you what kind of series JoJo's is like. If somebody asks you, and hey, should I get into JoJo's? What's it about? Basically tell them that JoJo's best main character is a cripple who gets turned on by bug bites. And that should pretty much do it, honestly. But in all seriousness, Johnny really did touch a chord with me. Seeing how he was in the past and getting a little more into his backstory and what he was like before he got crippled, seeing how he got crippled, really showed how far he's come and how much he's been humbled due to his origins. And seeing the overall poor and just crappy relationship he had with his dad, which was kind of, I'm not gonna lie, me and the boys in the Discord kind of memed on that for a little bit. But really overall how Johnny fits within part 7 is great. Again, not only just character development and progression, because that's not just everything within a character, but as well how he works with the themes of part 7. How ironic it is that a cripple is going to try and win a race. I really do love Johnny because he took everything that I loved about Jonathan in part 1 and he added more complexity and just did it better. And that should say a lot because Jonathan is like my third favorite JoJo protagonist despite me knowing he's probably one of the worst written ones. And so, so far part 7 has had great pacing, good side characters, boasting one of the best minor antagonists, it also has some really good themes. It took what JoJo did best and did it better, but if there was one thing that I had to point to. One character in specific, one man, one certain president, if you will. We are talking, of course, about the best antagonist in JoJo's, and one of the best antagonists that I've read in manga, period, and that is Funny Valentine. Oh my goodness! Now, uh, if you'll excuse me, I just spilled something, so let me go grab a napkin. Those that read part 7 will get the reference. Now, unlike some of the other parts in JoJo's, I really do appreciate how Funny Valentine really does have his fingerprints on every single thing that does happen, despite him not necessarily being present. Also, um, just a quick question, because this has also thrown me off about Funny Valentine. Just really want to ask this before I get on to why he is such a great antagonist. I swear, I, I promise you that in the course of like a chapter or less, he went from like this five foot six fat out of shape man to this six foot three bodybuilder extraordinaire. Like what in the world? Was he like suppressing himself physically or something? Did I just not catch that? Or did Araki just was like, ah, oh, screw it. I might as well make him look cooler. I don't know. That's just always been on my mind. But one of the major captivating aspects of Funny Valentine is his stand, of course, D4C. 
D4C is probably one of the most confusing things when you first read it, but once you get it and catch it, it is absolutely brilliant how it works. But the real thing that I do appreciate about Funny, despite his stand being one of my favorite stands in all of JoJo's, one of the most also OP stands in JoJo's, is the stand does not make the man. Funny Valentine himself as a character, even if he were not to have a stand, would be still a phenomenal character, and that's large due to his extreme patriotic personality. This man has the United States of bloody America, not tattooed, scarred on his back. As previous soldier and now president of the United States, he sees it as his duty to protect his country. He understands that if he doesn't protect his country, nobody else will. And the fact that he's willing to go to such great lengths, understanding fully that what he's doing may not be the best morally, again, hence why dirty deeds done dirt cheap is a saying for him. But in that moment where he opens up to Johnny about his true love for the country and him seeing this as the greater good of what's best for the nation, it really does add this dynamic to Funny Valentine, where at first it may have seemed that he was just this purely evil dirtbag, but at the end of it you understand that he was really trying to accomplish the greater good for what he valued the most and what he had worked so hard for his entire life. Funny Valentine was just written to basically near perfection, although there are moments where I wish some of his expositions came at a more appropriate timing. Him kind of opening up to Johnny in the moment that he did made sense due to the fact that it could have been a major turning point, but then again, it was sort of like, is he really trying to pull a talk no jutsu on Johnny? However, part 7 as a whole was done greatly, and due to all of the things that was happening with Funny Valentine, acquiring the parts of the corpse and finishing the race, the ending itself was the climax, which is really great because it truly felt like the ultimate climax of the story, and knowing how JoJo's really does structure its parts and how it likes to write out its story, the ending being as appropriate as possible as it could have been to the overall themes of all of the characters is something that I truly do appreciate. For me, part 7 definitely had the best pacing, some of the best minor antagonists, some of the coolest stands, the best Joe bro, the best main protagonist, and the best main antagonist. This part alone took JoJo's from being at around my number 7 or 8 in my top 10 to being up to number 5. Part 7 truly was great. I love Steel Ball Run a lot and I can't wait for the day that it actually gets animated because I will watch it. So if you are new to the channel make sure you like, comment, and subscribe as well as turn on the bell notifications that way you're notified when a new video pops up on some of your favorite anime, manga, or whatever content. As always, this has been The Masked Man. Hope everyone has a blessed rest of the day, and peace.